For this wine tray, I'm going to use the funky end from a piece of walnut and a resin stream down the center. My first task here was to build the form for what I needed. So it's kind of a long and boring process, so I called in some help. I'm using tuck tape over an MDF board. It's essentially a box without a lid, and the tuck tape keeps resin from sticking to it. I like using MDF for this kind of work because it's incredibly flat and right from the store. Building the box, I drilled some pilot holes and used some cheap but sturdy screws to hold it together. Over at the miter saw, I chopped off the funky end and then chopped that at an angle. This is not a great example for something that would have been easy with a crosscut sled on my table saw, but I don't have that yet. Don't be fooled by the camera angle here. My fingers are much further from the blade than it looks. My miter saw wasn't long enough to cut this whole piece at once, so after I made an initial cut, I had to flip it around and then get the rest of it. Once I had those two pieces, I dropped them in the form to check the fit. The river gap was a bit wider than what I wanted, so I found some spacers to help adjust the width. In a resin project like this, I highly recommend making your form just a slight bit larger than what you need for your final dimensions. This way, if you need to trim the edges up at all, you'll still have room to work. So what I'm doing here is scraping away all the bark and loose material and then sanding it clean. The loose material can get in the way of the resin forming a strong bond with the wood. So next, I put a thin layer of shellac over the whole piece. This prevents resin from staining the wood where I don't want it to be, and it also helps reduce air bubbles. Now, something very important here is you need to come back and sand off that exterior layer of shellac from where you want the resin to actually stick. Now, I'm gonna stop and talk about this for a moment. Now, I've seen two schools of thought from very well-established businesses on how to handle this. Both are trying to solve the same problem of air bubbles. One is doing the way that I'm doing here, and if you don't sand away that outer layer of shellac, the resin won't stick, and you'll end up with something like my coffee table after one change in season. Wood moves, period. No matter how much finish or coating you put over the entire thing, wood will move. These projects can last for quite a few years if done correctly, though. The reason mine failed is probably a combination of resin not forming a good enough bond, uh, but also, the legs are screwed very uh, tightly and actually bolted into the table and they don't allow for any wood movement. The other method here is to use a very slow drying resin, you know, something that takes one to two days before starting to solidify. This will give the resin time to seep into the wood, release air bubbles, and they'll rise and pop on their own. Back to the form, I'm caulking the edges to prevent resin from seeping through any little gaps. It's a liquid and it will find a gap. Then I check my area to make sure it's level. Use any wedges or shims needed to keep it level. Now onto the fun part, trying to optimize the amount of resin used. The concept is simple, find the volume of the space needed to fill. You can get wildly complicated here or just keep it simple. Start with the volume of a rectangular prism, length times width times height. For this irregular shape, however, we can use averages to help out. Length is the average of the stream down the center, which is about 14 inches here. Width is the average width of the longest point across the stream, for me about five inches. And in this case, the height will be the average depth of the pour, so about an inch. To get the average width, I take a measurement about every inch from the widest point on one side to the widest point on the other. I took eight measurements here, so I added the measurements together and divided by the total number of measurements to get my average width. So my numbers came out to about 14 inches times 5 inches times 1 inch, which is 70 inches cubed. And generally you want to add about 10% for waste for absorption and evaporation. In my case I also added a little bit more to fill in the gaps on the ends. To get liters, divide that by 61.024 to get about 
or go straight to fluid ounces by dividing 1.805 and you'll get around 38.8. So 38.8, that's the total number of fluid ounces you'll need. And for a two to one mix, you need two thirds of that as the resin and one third of that as the hardener. I used eco epoxy on this. It takes over two days before this stuff becomes hard to the touch and another three or four before it fully cures. It mixes together very well and the pigment I used mixed together perfectly also. I'm very happy with this product and will certainly use it again for deeper pours or larger projects in the future. Oh, and don't forget to put some blocks over the wood and clamp them down so the wood doesn't rise. You'll lose a lot of epoxy that way. Resin pours are perfect to do on the weekend. You can let it sit all week to fully cure it. And by the next weekend, it's ready to square up and flatten down. For this project, I shaved just a little bit off of each side so that it was clean, squared up, and I didn't have to worry about any weird resin patches sticking out off the ends. Over on the planer, you want to take very light passes on this. Resin can heat up and gunk up your blades pretty quickly, so make sure you're taking very light, very subtle passes. And just keep doing that until it's to where you need it. Now it's time to drill some holes and hopefully not screw this board up. Considering it took a week to get to this point, I was very careful to mark and measure out where I'll be drilling. First up is the hole for the bottle. I used a three and a quarter inch hole saw bit for this and the size will fit most bottles just fine. Uh, if you got any fatter bottles, then you might want to consider a fatter hole. Not shown is me squaring off the corners for the wine glasses. Doing this first helps get those measurements a little bit more accurately. So for those holes, I started off with a two inch forcener bit then a smaller bit to drill all the way through. Also not pictured was me using a bandsaw to cut those corners out for these wine glass stems to fit in. Over at the router table, I put a chamfer on the bottom edge and a subtle round over on the top edges. Because I was dreading sanding everything, I decided to start working on the legs. I chopped up a small piece on the bandsaw, and there were three simple legs for balance, and one more to hold the bottle, and it has a couple parts to it. I decided at this point that it was a good time to start grinding my knuckles down on the spindle sander. glue to hold the bottle holder together, and this project can't be complete without a strength test. I took a full container of mineral spirits and dropped it on the ends of the bottle holder. That should work. Now that the legs are all cut and shaped to size, I drew some more lines on the board to mark the mortises. These were about a half inch deep just enough for a small seat. Over at the drill press, I set a standard depth and started drilling out most of the material. From there, I could take a chisel to clean out the rest of it. And before I officially turned my brain off and went into sanding mode, I did a test fit with all pieces to make sure they were all gonna fit just nice. Back to the most joyful part of the project, sanding. With resin, you do have to be a bit more tedious and thorough with the grits. Sanding marks show up much more easily on resin than wood. So I started with 80 grit, then moved to 120, 180, 220, 320, and finally 400. I did all of this uh, on the resin and for hand sanding, uh, and those marks uh, in the smaller spaces, I didn't go all the way up to 400, I just went up to 220 for that.
for assembly, I drop some glue on the mortises and clamp them down. It doesn't get much easier than that. After a little bit of magic and forgetting to press record, it's all done. I used Osmo 1101 and a coat of Osmo 3043 on this. This finish combo does a great job of bringing out the color and grain of the wood. It looks fantastic over resin and also lets you actually feel the wood grain. The last touch is grapes, cheese, bottle of wine, and two glasses. When resting on a surface, the wine glasses sit perfectly on the table. And when you lift it up, Wine glasses sink right down into those holders, fitting perfectly.